Hi, welcome back to Assessment Joining the Dots. We're GL Assessment or GL Education, depending on where you are in the world. We're a Renaissance company and the leading provider of standardised assessments in the UK and Ireland. We also work with schools in over 100 countries worldwide. We're doing this podcast because we're passionate about supporting teaching and learning by helping all of you to make the best use of your insights from your data. You'll find some reoccurring segments like our data spotlights, where we demystify commonly used terminology in standardised assessments and educational data. Thank you so much for supporting us and tuning in to listen to our latest episode. I'm Bernadette Brzyska, Head of Research at GL Assessment. My team are heavily involved in many aspects of assessment, development and maintenance. So today I've got with me Tom Hooley, who's our assessment project manager. Um, we will be covering a widely unknown topic of how standardised assessments are developed. Um, to give you a bit of insight into the complexities of the process, why it might take longer than you think, um, encourage schools also to take part in our all important trials. So um, Tom and I will go over the brief summary of the main steps in assessment. Um, there are many other in-depth areas of assessment development that we could cover in future podcasts um, that we can make use of in future aspects. Uh, we'll wait to hear feedback from you all on what you might want to know more about after the podcast. So where does the process of development start? Well, we need to define what it is we want to measure within the assessment. We need to define what we call the construct. We often keep an eye on what is happening in schools, where the needs are. Uh, we talk to schools all the time about where our assessments might need updating, changing due to shifting requirements in schools. Um, and while updates to tests can't be made easily or quickly, we can plan for these over the years. Now today, I think we'll focus a little bit more on development of a totally new assessment from scratch. This is where Tom comes in. Have you got any nice examples for us that we can use? Indeed. So handily, I can use some examples from our recent development uh, of the new adaptive maths test that we're actually building right now. Um, so for this, for example, uh, we need to establish the construct and the domain of the assessment. The construct is essentially what we're measuring, and the domain is basically what we're using to measure the construct. So in this instance, the construct we're measuring is maths and maths ability, and the domain that we're testing against is the maths English national curriculum. Nice. Uh, and I guess before we go into the nitty gritty of question writing, which is where we would naturally go to first, um, it's also really important, I think, to understand um, how we want to maybe administer that assessment. So there's a lot of work that goes into the specification of how an assessment might be going out to market. Um, we work a lot with the customers, with our schools and experts in the field to maybe establish what the best practice might be. For example, um, we might want to uh, look at where a test is going to be paper or digital or maybe both? Will it be administered one-to-one -one because it needs to involve observational measures that a, a, an administrator might need to, to add? Or is it absolutely fine for that assessment to sit in front of a class, a whole class in a school um, in one go? We also establish things like question types up front. Can it be a test of fully multiple choice response questions? Or does it need a little bit more information from each learner um, in terms of longer open response questions. Um, there's also things about how long practically an assessment might need to be in a school. Um, and this might be, for example, that it has to fit within a lesson because that makes the most sense within the school context, um, but also balanced against how long that test needs to be to gain the right coverage of the domain that we're testing against and maybe ensuring that that test is also going to come out reliable overall. So. Once we've got all of that established and we've got a, an overall plan, we then go on to authoring. Um, Tom, can you tell us what an item is and how they're authored? Sure thing. So an item really is just a piece of assessment jargon. It refers to a test question, a singular test question. The reason that we, we use the term item rather than test question is that linguistically, uh, questions aren't always questions in assessments. You could have subtract five from 10, for example. So just on a practical level, that's why we use the term item. Now, one of the things that we have to do before we can begin writing our items is we have to generate something called an item specification, which is shared with our authors. Now, an item specification essentially denotes the, the topics that we want the items to cover. 
It has to entail the demand or the difficulty of the items that we want to produce. And it also shows how many items overall we actually want to have written. Yeah, perfect. Um, so who typically writes the items? Who do we tend to work with for those items? Um, so typically, um, we'll work with subject matter experts. Uh, that usually takes the form of current or former teachers. Uh, and they will write the items against the specification uh, that we've created. Now, authors generally are responsible for the writing of the item, um, the rationale, which is basically what we might learn about a learner when they get the item either right or wrong. Um, they're also responsible for producing the mark scheme, uh, defining the age appropriateness of the item, and assigning a demand or difficulty uh, level to that item as well. Um, where relevant, authors will also provide briefs for the creation of illustrations or other media uh, to be delivered alongside an item in a live testing testing scenario. Yeah, so that might be like a picture that supports the story in a narrative passage if you were doing a reading test uh, without obviously giving any answers away. Um, or maybe in a case of a maths test, a chart that's integral to that maths item that's, uh, that's being put forward. Uh, what happens next? Uh, so once the items have been written and been submitted uh, by our authors, and um, they are reviewed internally by uh, subject matter and assessment experts. And where necessary, uh, any amendments will be made just to get them to that final trial-level state. But once we've got that, we then split all of our items into what we call trial-level booklets. These are otherwise uh, referred to as linear item test forms. Um, within each of these test forms, we essentially have to balance the domain and curriculum coverage uh, we have to balance the item types and demand levels. And we also want to ensure we're not including any any enemy items within these test forms as well. Yeah, I guess it's worth saying enemy items are those that we can't include in the same test as they tend to give the answer away or just a different way of asking the same question. Do you have any examples of those? Yeah, of course. So a really basic example of this would be something along the lines of item one reading um, a circle measures 360 degrees how many degrees does a semicircle measure? Item two then might read, how many degrees does a circle measure? So straight away, item one in the stem has given away the answer to item two. Now, this is a very basic example, and there are more nuanced ways that an item can function as an enemy, uh, which is why we go through such rigorous checks during the item authoring and the uh, splitting into trial and booklets to ensure that none of those items appear in the same form as each other. Well, we might find that one of those questions works better than another. Um, so that's why we trial them in different styles, yeah. What happens next then? So once we've got our items into trialable booklets, uh, we then go into the item trialing stage of the process. Now, each assessment that we produce goes through a minimum of two trials. Uh, the first is known as an item trial. Now, up until this point, our item development has been built purely upon the knowledge and judgment of our subject matter and assessment experts. This means that an item trial is actually the first time our items are being seen by learners and the first time that we have the opportunity to figure out if these items are working. Therefore, we basically want to make sure our items are functioning from a few different perspectives. But mainly, is the content of the item appropriate for the level it's being trialed at? And also, is the format of the item or the item type performing well and not hindering the overall item or introducing any unintended bias? Now, for example, in a test such as NGMT, one of the item types we use is multiple choice. Um, here, a learner is presented with the test question and a series of responses to choose from. One of the responses, or one of the given responses, I should say, is correct, and the remaining responses are incorrect. These incorrect responses are known as distractors. Now, if during a trial a distractor is never chosen by a learner, or conversely, uh, is chosen too much, it might denote that the um, distractors are too weak or too strong. If that happens, we might go in and decide to tweak that item as it's impacting the overall quality and the performance during testing. Yeah, that's true. And I guess for other item types, other examples might be that Although every attempt can be made to foresee sort of the different responses that learners can give when answering our questions, sometimes children give weird and wonderful answers that might actually end up that we want to tweak our, our mark scheme to credit those responses um, or actually tweak the questions themselves if they're finding it too difficult to help try and scaffold the learners a little bit. Exactly right. And therefore, the purpose of the item trial is to collect that quantitative evidence 
to validate the validity, reliability, and the robustness of the items that have been created and ensure they are of the requisite quality to be taken forward into the final assessment. This is also why it's so important that we get a variety of schools involved in our trials, I guess, so that the answers given by those learners are from a really nice range of different learners, different schools. Um, at the end of the podcast, actually, uh, you can find out how you can get more involved. Um, we'll keep plugging away because it's really important that we want schools, as many schools as possible, to take part in our trials when we're developing assessments. So what happens after the item trial has taken place? Uh, well, there are a number of uh, statistical metrics that we use to validate the quality of our items that help us to determine the difficulty of an item, as well as its ability to discriminate between the higher and lower ability learners in the sample. There are many other metrics involved as well that our team of statisticians provide for us, and they all feed into our review and selection process for our final item pool. Um, it's important to note that during this process, following an item trial, only the best items are retained and taken forward. So we now have our item pool, our final items, and we develop that assessment, we construct it. What happens now for a standardised assessment, which is the majority of our assessments are standardised ones? Indeed. So once we have our final assessment and our assessment pool, um, we take it to a much larger nationally representative sample of learners and schools from across the UK for its second trial. This is our standardisation trial, and this forms what is often referred to as the norm group. Maybe it's worth outlining. What are the differences between an item and a standardisation trial then? Uh, well, besides the standardisation trial being much larger than the item trial, there are a few other key differences. So an item trial generally is conducted either at the beginning or at the end of an academic year. A standardisation trial, however, is conducted at the time in the academic year when we recommend the live version of the assessment is taken. This is because a standardisation is essentially a snapshot into the ability and curriculum understanding of a learner at a certain point in the academic year. Therefore, it would be inappropriate, for example, um, to take an assessment in the spring term that was standardised for use in the summer term, as the ability and curriculum understanding of learners will be different between these two points in time. Yeah, the learners may not have learnt yet the content of the curriculum that we're testing. So, yeah, it's it's important we align that. A question we sometimes get, actually, from customers. Can you change questions or mark schemes or anything within a live test after it's been standardised? That's a really good question. Um, but no, in theory, you shouldn't. So no changes should be made to an item following a standardisation trial. This is because any change, no matter how small will affect the likelihood of a correct response, be that positively or negatively, i.e. making the item easier or harder. This alteration would then differ from the likelihood of a correct response during the standardisation trial, and it's that difference that we want to avoid. So what's produced after a standardisation trial? What are we able to give schools who have taken part? Uh, well, following a standardisation trial, we produce something called a standard age score, otherwise known as a SAS uh, lookup table. And these are produced to help us um, compare learners who take the live test against the learners of the same age in the standardisation and compare the average learner scores nationally. Uh, a little later in the podcast, um, our data spotlight will cover off uh, more about SAS and how it can be used and interpreted. So we work really closely uh, with all the different parts of the business. Obviously, once a standardization has happened, we work with lots of different parts of the business to get that test out and launched and live. Um, if it's a paper test, we need to liaise with our warehouse in Swindon, for example, um, to make sure we get, uh, we get appropriate printouts uh, ready and underway. We need to work with the scoring team to make sure that the uh, marking is all up to scratch that people are trained on how to mark those paper tests. In a digital assessment, we also need to make sure that we work on those reports. And we can work on those reports over the next few years to also make sure that everything that schools want from that assessment is captured and is fed back to them. Um, we produce, I guess, also a load of other things like manuals and administration instructions uh, to make sure that the people administering our tests can, can follow the same simple instructions um, and and make sure we get the most reliable data from our tests. Um, for NGMT, I guess this will be available as soon as the tests are completed. Um, in the standardizations, as marking is automatic and the results will be digitally available as well. 
It's one of the benefits of digital, I guess, over uh, paper tests. Thanks very much, Tom. I'm sure there'll be loads of questions um, that also come in. It always feels very weird to be sort of summarizing it in such a short period of time, something that takes two to three years to develop a, an assessment from scratch. Um, to sort of summarize it into 15 minutes might feel very weird. Um, but we'd love to take people through if there are any questions that come through as a result of this podcast. If you get in touch with GL, we could maybe pick up on some other more in-depth pieces uh, about test development if anyone's interested. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Bernie. Now we're moving into our Data Spotlight Explainer, designed to demystify data and assessment terminology. I'll hand over to Rachel and Darren to explain SAS. Well, welcome to our Data Spotlight. My name's Darren and I'm also joined today by Rachel, who's a former Deputy Primary Head. And today we're talking about Standard Age Score, or SAS. And this is the most frequently used measure in GL assessment. So hi, Rachel, could you explain for all the teachers out there who haven't come across this term before, what SAS actually is? Hey, Darren, um, yeah, of course I can. So the standard age score, or SAS as we like to call it for short, compares a student's performance to others of the exact same age nationally. So the SAS is based on a student's raw score, so how many marks or points they achieved within the assessment. This is then adjusted for their age in years and months and placed on a graph that compares students nationally. It gives us the most fair and consistent measure of performance. Yeah, and I think then that the key thing in there is national because there's a lot of schools that have said this is helpful for their own settings, but also to have that national perspective is so useful. I just wondered, have you got any like real life examples that you could compare SAS with? So an example that we often often use when talking about the SAS is if we measure the heights of people. So if we think about measuring the heights of, say, 30 people within a group, we'll find a common pattern. The majority of people will be around average height, which is shown in the middle of that graph. But some people will obviously be taller and some people shorter which is shown at either end of the graph. Like with heights, a SAS of 89 to 111 is considered average, along with the majority of learners. Those with a SAS under 89 are performing below average, and then those above 111 are performing above average. And those numbers that you talk about there um, are very similar to scaled scores within SATs. Could you just try and explain what the difference is between a SAS and scale score? Yeah, they are quite they are quite similar, and we, we often do get questions where schools are, are asking, "Is how does this relate, and are they the same?" And even though they are similar, that they are different. So, scaled scores are related to a set of criteria, which is reviewed by the DFE at the end of each year. T stage two SATs are designed to be different each year, which means the level of difficulty varies. If the test decreases in difficulty, the raw score needed to meet the expected standard will increase. No such adjustments are needed with a SAS. It's considered the fairest and most consistent way to compare performance year on year. The average range for a SAS will always be the same. And I know you mentioned before in your previous role as a deputy head that you use SAS scores frequently. At what point did you use them to help? provide further support for your pupils. Yeah, they were always really useful in thinking about how to plan for, for some of that support or possible intervention for groups of students. So if we're going back to thinking about that height example again, at different points along the graph, a significant difference in height from the average could make certain things more challenging or in fact give someone an advantage. In reality, I'm quite tall, so I can quite easily head into the kitchen and reach that hidden sweetie tin on the top shelf. But for someone shorter, they might need a bit of support. They might need an extra step up to reach that, that hidden sweetie tin. So for any student, but particularly those above or below average, when thinking about support, we must also consider the context. Context is key context for your school and each individual student. Alongside that, every school needs to decide how they prioritise support. But we really would encourage schools to particularly think about SAS scores of 85 or less 
and also where they might see big differences of scores between tests. Yeah, brilliant. Rachel, your insights today have been really helpful. I'm sure there's everyone listening to this today has given them some help towards SAS. So please join us on our next podcast where we'll be going into further data spotlights. Now, on to our light bulb moment this month from Jonathan Bishop, CEO at Cornerstone Academy Trust, with special thanks from us for sharing their story. The light bulb moments allow us to share your stories, to understand the power of data. Perhaps you know already how you can get the most from your assessments, or perhaps you'll learn something new and be able to take something away from the stories shared. What was the moment you realized the power of your GL assessment data? What difference did it make to you or your learners? What did you learn? And what problem did it help you to solve? I'm Jonathan Bishop, the CEO of Cornerstone Academy Trust. And we, across the group of schools, use um, the complete digital solution from GL Assessment. So we're looking at the triangulation of need around the children. At the heart of this are the progress tests. So we're using the PTE, PTM and PTS, English, Maths and Science. And we run these uh, tests. They're uh, digital tests, uh, the complete digital solution. So each child will... Um, sit at a computer with a pair of headphones on and uh, undertake these tests twice a year. Really, we're working off the summative test at the end of the year, and we're looking at the progress they've made from the year before. And what this is allowing us to do is track progress over time, and that's really important for us. Um, but more importantly, we then use the CAT scores and the PASS scores. So with CAT, we're looking at that cognitive ability and we're seeing if they've made progress that's good progress in relation to their cognitive ability. We're then looking at PASS to see the attitudes that they've got towards themselves as a learner and a score. And by triangulating around the needs of the child, we're able to uh, start to plan to meet them to ensure success for all. So to get involved, it's really easy. All you need to do is send us a WhatsApp voice note with your contribution to 07917 516 515. Many thanks to all who have sent their voice notes in so far. We've loved listening back to these and look forward to sharing more next time. Thanks for joining us for our assessment joining the dots podcast don't forget we're always recruiting schools for our trials at different times of the year and if you want to get involved please do email us on product.trialing at gl-assessment.co.uk if you'd like any more information from us please head to our training and support site which you can find at support.gl-assessment.co.uk or support.gl-education.com depending on where you are in the world tweet us at gl underscore assessment or at gl underscore education and email us if you'd like to know more or contribute. We'd love to hear from you and the email address is podcast at gl-assessment.co.uk. Please do follow our podcast on whichever platform you're listening to us on. Subscribe to be notified when new episodes are available. It would be amazing if you shared with your friends and colleagues on social media and rate our podcast. You can also check out the Renaissance Space podcast from our friends at Renaissance. Join us next time for when we will be joining the dots on speech and language assessment. Thanks again for joining us and see you next time.